Paging is a form of memory management common in modern operating systems. Modern systems typically incorporate paging into a virtual memory system, which involves storing some portions of memory on disk. However, we will first discuss simple paging, which takes place entirely in memory. Consider the following example. In this example, we have 32 megabytes of main memory, which I've broken up into four megabyte chunks called frames. Frames store pages, which are chunks of an executing process. Assume that processes make the following memory requests. A requests 12 megabytes, B requests 10 megabytes, and C requests 2 megabytes. A 12 megabyte request can be split into three 4 megabyte chunks. So we will have a process A that is divided into three pages. The first page, which is page 0 of process A, will go in the first available frame in memory. The next page of process A, page 1, will go in the next frame, and the third page will go in the frame after that. Now, so far, it just looks like we're filling in memory sequentially, but later we'll see how things get more interesting once processes get removed. But for now, let's finish processing these requests. So B is requesting 10 megabytes of memory. This cannot be evenly divided by 4. So the first frame that is available here will contain the first 4 megabytes, the first page of B. So we'll have a page B0 here. Now the following page of B has also 4 megabytes. And so we have 10 megabytes total. We have 4 assigned here, 4 more, that's 8. We now have 2 left. So our third page, B2, will only take up half of this last frame. But as usual, we've assigned this whole frame to process B. So this empty space is another example of internal fragmentation. So the internal fragmentation is what we're seeing here in this box here. Next, process C requests 2 megabytes. And so it only needs one frame. And it will only take up half of that frame. And now we have a memory that is mostly full. We have one free frame down here that could still hold up to 4 megabytes. Now where paging gets interesting is when processes get vacated or released and replaced with others. So we will now do the following actions. The next two actions we will carry out are to release process B from memory and then a new process D will request 13 megabytes. So when B is released we simply erase the frames that it occupies like so. So now we have some empty frames in the middle of memory and this is where things get interesting because when D requests its 13 megabytes we will put the first three pages of D into these first three frames but the fourth page can actually be put in this frame that is on the other side of the frame occupied by C. In other words, it is completely okay to split up the individual pages of the process 
across various frames in memory. So when we put D into memory, it will look like this. So now that D has been placed into memory, we see that pages 0, 1, and 2 come before the frame containing process C, and that page 3 of process D is on the other side of the frame containing C. And because D requires 13 megabytes, it means this last page only consists of one megabyte. Therefore, we have even more internal fragmentation than before. Now, to keep track of all of this information, we actually need a special structure that is also stored in memory called a page table. Now, Technically, in my small example here, I've completely filled the memory um, and I'm not showing where the page table is stored, but just assume that the page table I'm about to show you is actually stored in memory somewhere in a real system. So here is what a page table looks like for these processes. So notice that I have added labels on the left here. These numbers are labels for the frames in memory. So this first frame is frame 0, this is frame 1, and so on. There are eight total frames numbered 0 to 7. Now what I've drawn here are the page tables for each of these processes. Process A has this page table, and all a page table is is a list of where the frames containing the pages are located. So for process A, we have a fairly simple mapping. Page 0 of process A is stored in frame 0. Page 1 is stored in frame 1, and page 2 is stored in frame 2. Now the other two processes are more interesting. C consists of a single page. Page 0 of process C is stored in frame 6, shown here. And for D, we have pages 0, 1, and 2 stored sequentially in frames 3, 4, and 5. But then page 3 is stored in frame 7. So as I said, just recall that this information is technically also tracked in memory as well. And this is actually why I've drawn memory addresses here on the side of the memory depiction. So these are hexadecimal address values. These are the actual memory addresses at the boundaries between the frames. So what I'm going to show you next is how the processor and the operating system can use page tables to figure out where the different pieces of the processes are stored in memory. Now this requires some special hardware that the operating system is designed to use. So let's take a look at how this works. From process D's perspective, it can access 13 megabytes of memory. Now all memory references within a particular process are logical references that only depend on that specific process's address space. So from D's perspective, it can address locations 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 in hex through 0, D, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, also in hex. Now note that this is an actual address that can be accessed, and this is actually just outside of the boundary of what can be accessed. So process D can't actually access this address. It can access 
one address before this one, which would be this 0, C, F, 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 F address. So taking that into consideration, let's see what happens if process D wants to access its following logical address. So this address starts with 0, C, which if we simply think about how these numbers increase, if we were within the first four megabytes of these pages, we would have an address that was less than 0, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, and if we were within the first 8 megabytes, we'd be before 0, 8 in a bunch of zeros. And if we were within the first 12, we'd be under 0, C, and so on. So the fact that this address is slightly larger than 0, C, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, means that we must be somewhere within the fourth page. Uh, specifically, the physical memory address that corresponds to this logical address must be somewhere in this portion of memory. So in frame 7, where D's third page is. So the actual physical address of this logical address must be greater than 1C000000 in hex. But how is this calculated? Well, to figure this out, we're going to take this logical address and write it out in binary below. Recall that every digit in hexadecimal corresponds to exactly four binary bits. So here are the binary bits under their corresponding hexadecimal digits. This is the logical address that we want to access. Now, if you look at this sequence of bits, I want you to notice that this number of bits here is the number of bits that are required to address a space consisting of four megabytes. So the reason for this is that if we had a four here instead of a C, then this four bit sequence would be zero, one, zero, zero. And so the fact that the one is there accounts for the four megabyte portion and all of these remaining bits are all the different offsets within a four megabyte frame that you could access. So essentially, these first few bits can represent a specific frame in memory, meaning one of these horizontal dividing lines or one of these starting addresses. And then all of the remaining bits can be the offset within that particular block. So if this first sequence of six bits corresponded to the start of, say, this memory frame, then this sequence of bits here would be starting from this point in memory and moving forward by this many steps, the 00570. Now there's actually, I only mentioned 00570, but of course there's actually a zero here as well. There's two bit zeros and if we had to cast this into a hex value, it would be an additional hex zero because we're splitting this sequence of bits in the middle of one of its hex digits. Because we are splitting this binary sequence in the middle of a hex digit, in order to interpret 
what is to the left of that split, I have to sort of shift over where, how my bits are grouped in order to portray this binary number in hex. So if I start from the right edge of that split, then this sequence of bits is the hex value 0, 3, which in decimal is also 3. So what this sequence of 6 bits indicates is that we want to access a memory address that is in page 3 of the process. So we're using process D for this example and the pages are numbered starting at 0 so we have 0, 1, 2, and 3. So this number 3 directly corresponds to this number 3 here in the page table. It's like looking up an index in an array. At index 3 the page table says that we need to look at frame 7. So if we have the value 7 in hex and we convert that to binary, 7 in binary is simply 0, 1, 1, 1, and we have zeros to the left of that. In order to get the actual physical address that corresponds to this logical address, we simply replace the portion of the logical address that describes the page number. So I'm going to erase these bits here and I'm going to plug in this binary sequence for 7. And now I need to regroup these bits into uh, groups of 4 in order to get the hex value of the overall sequence. And we see that the resulting hex value of the physical address is 1C00570. So as we expected, the actual physical location of that logical address was going to be somewhere in page 3 of the process, which is in frame 7 of memory. So th this memory address here is 1C00000, and it turns out that this logical address we're trying to access is slightly after that, at 1C00570. So just below that address. And that is how paging is able to take a logical address with respect to a process and use a page table and decode it into a physical address in memory.